Welcome back to part three of our interview with uh, award-winning documentary filmmaker Helen Whitney. We've talked about her life uh, prior to becoming a filmmaker, her life as a filmmaker, the film she did about monks in a monastery, about Pope John Paul II. Uh, we've talked about her um, incredible film on uh, faith in 9-11, religion. And then we did a good hour, hour and 15 minutes on her incredible work with the documentary, uh, The Mormons. And now we are here to plug uh, uh, her latest film, which released earlier this year through PBS, Dealing with Mortality and Faith. Uh, and it's called Into the Night. And it's stunning. Uh, I watched it in full uh, yesterday, the day before in Park City. Uh, I was gripped, I was moved. And she is here tonight to plug it at uh, the Broadway, and she's hoping to fundraise for the second part to this documentary, which uh, extends it beyond the two beautiful hours that she's already released. But this movie talks about death, um, and it talks about all sorts of interesting things. You interview a mortician, you know, you interview someone who does cryogenics, you interview a radical Islamist, a former radical Islamist, and perhaps most powerfully, you interview people who are dying mm. and and I don't want to give too much away, but you know, they pass while mm. you're still making mm -hmm. the film. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you basically frame death or mortality as the great question, the great mm -hmm. human question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, why, what made you want to make this film and why did you make this film? Well, I... I'm of an age, and I'm going to be talking about this at the Broadway Theater because I'm sure it'll come up again. I am a baby boomer. I'm on the later side of midlife. And how could I not be thinking about these issues? And, you know, friends have died. Friends are dying. My beloved editor of 25 years, and really my closest friend died in the middle of this film. Um, yeah, so he, what was his he, name? He, he, of Ted Winterburn. There's the a little homage is, to him at the end. Who yeah, is he? It, it, he is my editor, one of my closest friends, if not my closest friends, and my collaborator. I, 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 he's been my editor for 20, 25 years, and he died in the middle of the production. So all this was around me, and, you know, there's a wonderful quote of by this amazing poet, Philip Larkin. Um, death is the roar underneath everything, and I really was feeling that roar uh, when I started to think about making this film. And uh, I felt it with an urgency and immediacy I don't usually feel. And, and, and uh, you know, look, a lot of the films I have been making have been leading up to this question. Uh, the four hours that preceded it, the forgiveness film. About Amish forgiving. Well, it's about, that's only one story, but the forgiveness series for PBS was four hours, explores forgiveness in the private realm, and in the political realm, it moves from adultery to genocide. And, and it's a great film. It, a great I, film. I mean, it's one of my favorites. And I explore through various, very rich stories, the questions that bedevil all of us about forgiveness. You know, uh, is it a power for the good? Or is, can it be premature? Or is there such a thing? as unforgiveness, an appropriate unforgiveness. These were, and when can forgiveness be dangerous to one's health? Uh, certainly premature forgiveness. But why I bring it up in relation to Into the Night is that I came to realize spending so much time in hospice with some of the people who were in the forgiveness film that at the end of life, the question of reconciliation uh, is paramount in so many people's lives. And and my great voice, who's in so many of my films, Lorenzo Albacetti, the Monsignor, he talks about it. He says, forgiveness precedes religion. That it, 
it, the desire to, to connect and to not be unconnected at the end of your life as you're facing the end is paramount. The questions people ask are, have, should I have forgiven that person? Can I, be, can I be forgiven? Did I reach out enough? I mean, these are questions that precede religion. They are the human condition. Just as our lust for certainty is, so is the need to be connected. And, and so anyway, uh, knowing that and doing, I mean, one of the big interviews in the film was someone who was dying and felt unforgiven by God because he had killed somebody in a prison camp when he liberated Auschwitz. He actually killed a German commander. He just was executioner and he killed him. No one would have blamed him. And yet his entire life, he held this to himself. And his, his kids came to me and said, you know, because uh, I was interviewing other people in the hospice. They said, this, our father refuses to die. We know he wants to die. He's been here for a year. And there's something on his mind. Would you talk to him? Because he became so interested when I mentioned, when they mentioned, you're making a film about forgiveness. So I went to his bedside, and he pours out this story and of his terror of not being forgiven, that he's lived with this all of his life. He tried to talk to his wife about it. He didn't want to hear and he felt this incredible sense of relief telling me about it, told the camera about it. It's like he, a deathbed confession. A deathbed confession, and he died soon after, hmm. peacefully. It was, it was very interesting. So, in other words, I have been circling around this subject of mortality. And start, does it start with your parents? And yes, uh, the death of my parents when I was very young cast a shadow of my life, and I certainly felt the power, the finality of death, and really consider it that existential question to which there is no answer. Why must we die? And I, in order to make it less of a shadow, is and I think this became very clear in the film as I was interviewing people, is the question should be, how do we live knowing that we will die? How do we live with death in our eye? And how, would he, how do we live consciously? How, and knowing that we'll die, shouldn't we be crafting our narrative, what, whatever it is, religion, science, art, Whatever the narrative is that softens the blow of death, belief, unbelief, science, art, anything, should we be crafting it now, not later when we're moving into dementia or, si or sick or have that phone call we all dread? So it was a question I long wanted to ask. And the great thing about being a filmmaker is that you can ask those questions, questions that people are frequently dying to ask, but in pol you, know, you don't. You don't stop at dinner party and ask, you know, how does everybody feel about the fact that they're going to die? Well, I could talk to anybody about this question, and I chose, I decided to focus on people who had been shocked into mortality, whether they were dying soon, they they were living with a bad diagnosis, or whether a close relative had died, or they were just temperamentally born to question, or had an epiphany. I mean, but all of them had been shocked, and it really is different when you're shocked into an awareness that you will die, when it's not abstract, when we're not just saying to everybody, oh, we know we must die, it's a human condition, it all must happen to us, when it's upon you, or you feel it's upon you when your daughter dies, your son dies, it's, and you're forever changed by that. You really are, and I found that. And so I focused on nine people in part one and nine in part two for whom death was no longer abstract. It was real, and they had to decide what their narrative was, and was it sustaining them? Did they really actually believe? The did they have the faith that they said they did? 
Sometimes they didn't. They had to craft another narrative. Was art going to sustain them or not? If not, what, would, what was of value? How do we live with this? What's of value? And that's, that gives solace, having that. And it's better to have it now, to live consciously now. And that is the question of the film. It's threaded throughout all the interviews. And they're all very different answers to that question. Let's dig into a few of the people you feature. Is okay. that okay? Absolutely. So the mortician, Kate, mortician. Caitlin Doty. Wow. So yeah, these images of like a crematorium and and she, yeah, talk about alternative mortician. She, she <laughs> is a fascinating young woman who was one of the founders of the death salon movement. What it's is huge. that? What is the death It's salon? like the death cafe movement. It, it start, the death cafe movement started about 15 years ago in Switzerland, moved to England, and is now sort of all over America. And the death salon movement really started with the millennials. And what it is is these people, usually youngsters, but not always, find a place that's comfortable and easy, whether it's a cafe or a kind of an auditorium in which... People come together and demystify death. They talk about it, and they they look at it, and they laugh about it, and they cry about it together. But it's no longer this bugaboo. They're it's they're domesticating their terrors, and it's really this part of a seismic shift in this culture of openness, a new a kind of yearning for openness, along with the fear and denial, there is this. And Caitlin's part of that movement. And she's a founder, really, of, of the death salon movement. And she's a practitioner of alternative burials. And yes, she worked in a crematoria. But why did she work in a crematoria? She was sh had a terrifying experience of death close up to her. She was shocked into it. But her parents never really talked about it with her. She was in a mall, eight or nine years old, and a child falls off the escalator and lands plop in front of her, a sound she will never forget. And the way death, death was dealt with, and in my generation as well, you didn't talk about it. It'll, you know, you just didn't talk about it. So her parents didn't. And death became an obsession to her. I mean, she went to graduate school, University of Chicago, studied all this stuff, learned about mortuary practices. But what it was, it was an obsession, not that was casting a shadow over her life. So she decided, I'm going to look at it close, up front. I'm going to look at the what terrifies me the most. What could be more terrifying than a crematoria? And she worked in a crematoria for a few years and in an embalming. And she grew to understand that our estrangement from the dead body is part of the problem. I mean, you know, the old days, the parlor was the funeral parlor where people laid out and people lived with the body for a while before they buried the body. And she, Days, right? Or days. A week. Absolutely. Yeah. Not just like, get it out of here. And she began to understand that people weren't picking up the urns of ashes. They were just kind of calling it in. And... But she emerged from that experience with the crematoria, awakened to life. Most of her, she clarified what her narrative was. She's an atheist, no belief. But she became more settled in her idea about her ashes flying into the netherworld because she was up front looking at it. And she said her life was transformed. This shadow lifted. She found herself falling in love, having this exciting life. She wrote a book, traveling around with her book, and just living more intensely and more consciously. She's a fascinating woman, and she is an example of, of what I'm trying to say in that film. She looked at death, had been shocked into it, and was the stronger and more vivid appreciator of life as a result of it. You it's know? almost like by staring death directly in the mm -hmm. face, mm -hmm. it became empowering to her yes. and it liberated her from a lot of the fear and anxiety it's, and well distress said. of yeah. trying to keep it at a distance. Yes. That seemed to be the lesson I took that from, is, that from is, your interview with her. Yeah. And it's extreme solution. I'm not advising everybody, <laughs> but it worked for her. Yeah. 
She says we need more ritual. We need better ritual around death. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, aside, one of the most brilliant parts of this film, you've got, you know, shots into outer space in the cosmos. You've got shots of fetuses, of little baby, little fetuses mm -hmm. in the womb. You've got shots of lava. You've got shots of marine life. Mm -hmm. And then Grand Canyon. And then you've got this woman who's kind of naked with scarves and she's kind of swirling in the air mm -hmm. while this really kind of like haunting operatic singer sings Don't Go. No, Talk about that element of the film. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm always trying to it's find very artistic. the visual metaphors that are not literal, that take you away from being illustrative, you know, sort of like, uh, just, we're at a school, let's look at the sign, school, you know, or we're speaking about death, so let's just... Gravestone, tombstone. Look at gravestone, whatever. <laughs> here is this, just to use one of the visual examples you brought up, here is this woman talking in the crematorium, she's interviewed in the crematorium where she worked, and she's saying, look, the first weeks I worked in this crematory, oh my God, I was terrified. I mean, I'm cleaning up the ashes, I'm, I'm shaving dead faces, I'm... Cutting the locks of hair. Cutting locks of hair of a baby. And, and she said, but I, ca and, but I came to understand, in her words, that death can be messy and ugly and beautiful as well. And... I wanted to contrast some of the very stark shots of the crematoria did not escape that anonymity and finality of the box going in, human remains written on it, with the beauty of these recreations of dead bodies, and one of them you mentioned with her scarves around her. And I felt it was important that that both of those images really illumine the idea of the messiness and ugliness of death and the beauty of it as well, and why she feels it's so important we should, that we should not be estranged from the body. So that was the impetus for that particular... Did you show bodies of... Because I saw some... The recreations. They, they, they were not dead. They, they were look not, like corpses, yeah, yeah, but, but they're they actors. Not. They're absolutely not. I was going to ask you. Absolutely not. I would why, never why? be disrespectful okay. of a body. Never. Okay, yeah, so yeah. so those yeah, were recreations. Yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely. Okay, I was absolutely. just curious about that. You know. They and looked then, real. <laughs> yeah. And then the cosmos, uh, here we have an astrophysicist who was shocked into mortality because his beloved brother yeah, dies. Yeah. And he's, everything changed for him. Yes. His brother was his protector, his right? His protector, much more so than his parents, much more so. His brother was his protector, and he was eight or nine years old, and no one was talking about death. And so he began to talk to the stars, in effect. I mean, it was the impulse to look at the heavens and to find his solace there, which he was able to do. Um, he, unlike me, looks up at the heavens, and instead of feeling existential dread, I'm so small and they're so big, he feels a kind of comfort. He, he was saying to me, Helen, just because the cosmic story is so large, it doesn't make my story any less, in, my story insignificant. I thought, wow, I mean, I, I feel the terror but he's able to fashion a narrative that gives him comfort thinking about death, that he's part of the cosmos, that there is a kind of language of order uh, that speaks to him and gives him comfort when he thinks about his mortality and therefore gave me an excuse to just roar into the heavens and, and use Maria Callas' voice uh, for that is famous, famous aria. Is she a famous... Uh, Mary Callas is the most famous opera singer who ever lived. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and she's... Sorry. For I, good reason. <laughs> for good reason. Go. She has a distinctive voice like no other. She died about 20 years ago. There is a new documentary that just came out about her at the New York Film Festival... Apparently amazing. I I urge you to go online and listen to her Costa Diva a hundred times. You, it is, and then listen to other people. There's nothing like it. And and it is the words for the are appropriate also. But anyway, so it gave me an excuse 
and a way of, e of deepening his thought that, that this, these faraway heavens who are dying and being born are not threatening, they're welcoming, at least to him. And, and so when he thinks about his death, he sees himself part of all that. And so it put flesh on the idea on that idea of his. So that was the reason for the cosmos. It wasn't just their pretty pictures. It was really going to the root of his narrative of comfort. I just think it was a brilliant technique to, to include those different types of visual images throughout, mm -hmm. instead of just yeah. headshot, headshot, yeah, headshot, yeah. headshot, right, headshot. Right. No, just and Br brilliant visual and audio uh, and sort so of I worked so uh, hard artistry. On that and the music too. Uh, is that a is that a new is that sort of something a bit new and creative that is uh, well wasn't I think that all of us you know of... some some documentarians are not that interested in it they are going for the the human face and which of course I am too a human face is riveting um, and you know particularly if you're doing an investigative film you don't want to spend too much time with visual metaphors deepening an idea you want to move on. And move on, and you know th these are films that uncover the truth about X and Y and Z. So there's less attention paid to that, and too often I feel the visual the visuals are illustrative. Again, let's have a picture of a ho of, of a of a hotel because we've just mentioned he moved down a hotel. I mean that's not deepening the thought. It's sort of a dead-on illustration of a tiny fragment of the meaning of that thought. It just says, here's where we are. So anyway, I mean, I, uh, and then there are filmmakers who just riot in and revel in the language of film, and that's why we're using it. We're not a book. It's not an essay. It's, it can never have the kind of, that kind of complexity that the book has, but what it can have is all those other elements of poetry and music and imagery uh, and cinematography and, and photography. It just and so if you don't, if you decide you're not going to go after chronology and history and eight thousand ideas, but you're going to choose a few and deepen them with all the elements of filmmaking, you, you, that's what, you, what should be done. Make yeah. use of the language of film. I love it. Okay, okay let's talk about Jim, how do you pronounce, Crace? Oh, my Craig? favorite, my favorite. He's my favorite guy. How do you pronounce it? Jim Crace. Okay. And he, to me, states the, the theme of the film, uh, the importance of storytelling, the importance of crafting a narrative. And you look at what happened to him. His, his father dies when he's an adult. And he's British, right? He's British. He's a famous novelist. He's who's won the Orange Prize, been the runner-up for the Booker many times. He's just extraordinary novelist. He's an atheist. He's a romantic atheist. <laughs> but his father was, an, as he said, an unreflexive atheist. He had never thought about these questions. Atheism for him was just pushing back against the ruling class. You know, God was the ruling class, therefore. So when he dies, he tells his son and his daughter and all of his friends, no ceremony, no storytelling about me, no graveyard. I don't want you even showing up. There'll be no rights. I wanted a socialist crematoria. I want you <laughs> to send me into the night that way. And they do it. And Jim has an almost nervous breakdown at the end of it. And he has to, he realizes we do need, as Caitlin said, rites and rituals. Attention should be paid to each life, to each story. And he, as he describes in the film, he said, I realized that I did not want to die that way. I wanted to craft my narrative. And as I began to think about my father's death, as he's thinking about it, I realized he did have one, but it was unthinking. It was nature, that he had planted all these oak trees, just unthinkingly, whenever we would go on a walk. And that's what he's left. And he said, that's my relationship to nature. He said, and I went out into nature. And he, said, he wrote a whole book called Being Dead, 
which opens his section in which a couple dies throughout the entire 350 pages. Their bodies decompose. They were killed by a, someone suddenly, and they, and they decompose, but then their lives unfold. So he is someone who's at peace with what happens to us in nature. He says, nature has the last say. And we have the time now, if that becomes your narrative, the love of nature, but nature, hoof and claw. And he said, it became my narrative of solace. He said, it's not to say that when the moment comes, I won't panic and I won't say, oh gosh, I'd rather not. <laughs> but he said it will be easier because I've been at work on that for a very long while after my father died. And then he also said another one of my narratives is that of gratitude. And that's why I use those images of the fetus growing because he, he spoke about Helen gratitude. Think about the billions of specks in the universe and universes and, and the rocks and gravel and, and fish and sperm and eggs that enabled you to be born you and, and, and me, me. He said the unlikeliness of it. And he said, how could I not be grateful for the time that I have and he said, I, I use that narrative as well when I have sort of dark thoughts and when I, and um, so he really, he's one of those romantic atheists, unlike the Dawkins atheists. He's not angry at religion. What does he say? How could I be angry Hostile. How could I be against a religion? Hostile to he said, I'm a storyteller. How could I be hostile to a religion which uses the storytelling as its Trojan horse to smuggle into our hearts? Solace. Solace. And the <laughs> solace doesn't have to be true, but it has to offer comfort. That's a that was sort of like powerful and haunting and a bit outrageous for me uh -huh. in this sense because he talks about sometimes realizing that as an atheist there's no religion so he wants to provide his fellow secular people with something mm -hmm. and he and he makes this statement in there that narratives comfort yes and he says the important and this is like for for those of us who have been battling with our faith about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. being lied to, mm -hmm. that that we were taught that the Book of Mormon is a historical document, mm -hmm. and we've we've arranged our entire lives and given our entire lives, mm -hmm. decades of our lives, ten percent of our income, all these important decisions around something that it turns out to not be true, right? From our perspective, right? Uh -huh. Truth really matters to us. But then he blows my mind with something that I've known on different levels. But mm -hmm. he says the important thing is not that the story is true, but that the comfort is real. real. I agree with him. <laughs> I do. I mean, you have to. And I think a lot of, I think that most of us are doubting Thomas's at the end. I really do. About? about believers Heaven. believers and 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 unbelievers who have their their narrative worked out but i think most of us i, I would say doubting thomas is i'm using a christian phrase but and maybe all along we've ha always i think more people are doubting thomas is than not and but and we're all many of us are sophisticated enough to know the yearning that has gone into many of these great stories, the resurrection story, you know, bringing Lazarus back <laughs> from the dead and 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 the life hereafter. And I think you can be conscious that there's a lot of myth in it, but you can also take solace that a number of people are with you believing in that myth. You can have a double vision about it. You can suspect it may not be literally true, but there's comfort to be had notwithstanding. It really is. Yeah, and that's what, that's, if you had to boil down the essence of religion, 
Some could argue it's about community. Some could argue it's about hope. But I think what your film is arguing is that a major pillar of religion is the comfort it provides around death. Yes. Yeah. And do you want to take that away from yeah. people? Well, I'm saying... Uh, uh, it, no, this film, it mentions two religious people only who have faith. One lost his faith and, and, and got it back, and the comfort it provides them. Nobody else in this film has faith, any belief. Any, and most of them are atheists. But what they do believe in is storytelling. And Caitlin has her story, which she's worked out, which is when I die, I'll become part of sort of the dust and I'll be in my alternative grave and I've sat in that graveyard and already many times and gotten used to it. Crace has come to a narrative that nature is the place he spent most of his life where he thinks about his novels and he is at peace with the tooth and claw of it and that he will be um, Adam Frank. He's not a believer, but he is totally respectful he said that. I'm, I'm a scientist, but I'm agnostic about what happens after. But I put my faith in the stars, that I'll be just up there somehow, and that will be all right. And he spent a better part of his life crafting that narrative as well. So it isn't, you know, and then we have the cryonicist who's pushing back against death, and he's refusing to die, and that's his narrative. I'm going to fight it. And that gives my life meaning right now. And if I have to die fighting it, at least I've known I'm fighting it. And then we have the woman with a near-beth experience uh, who's that has opened her up to life in a way that and, and removed the fear of death that gives her her that opened up her life. And then the Black Baptist who lost his faith and had to find it again after his sons died. And finally, the surgeon at the end, who is, you know, an agnostic, an atheist, who yearns for faith but knows that he, he can't find it, but finds his narrative in love and in friendship. He dies with radiant acceptance, having come to this deep understanding that that's what mattered in his busy, ambitious life. That was what mattered. He's an, he's an, he, he's, he ends the film. And he worked on his narrative. He, he fought against death for 12 years with that prostate cancer. And, and he moved through many phases of denial and rage and hope that he might have a blinding revelation and belief. And then the depths of the friendships and the deepening of his relationship with his wife and that final sort of riff with his best friend, the man who made the coffin with him, he was ready to go. And the last 10 years, as he said, with his narrative shaped, were very good years. So, One quote that was really shocking to me was just this idea that people want comfort more than truth. Mm -hmm. Why are you surprised? You know, they want certainty more than truth. Um, but they want truth as well. But he's speaking not for everyone, Jim Crace, but he's speaking for a lot of people. Listen, we're, we're living in a scientific age. Most of us are dying without the certainties of religious consolation in the Western world, not in other worlds. Uh, and so I think we are of divided mind. We're, as I said before, many of us are certainly sophisticated in the world religions and in our own, and we're aware of the, of what's human and man-made about these narratives. But many of us have experienced signals of transcendence in, in our lives, I mean, in our daily lives that leads us to hope. We've experienced them, you know, whether in the middle of French, you know, and dinner with a friend or listening to great music or, or comforting a child saying everything's going to be all right when you're thinking, how do I know that? <laughs> you're lying to your child. And there are moments when all of us feel that there's something that's pointed us to a larger reality. 
we can't scientifically ground it, but that's comfort. Can we say, sign on the dotted line, we know it's to be true, but we're willing to, because it also enlivens our life. It, it, it just allows us to live more consciously now. One of the, I think it was the cancer patient that you interview says he would not, cool. and it's kind of a cliche, right? Yeah, you hear that. You hear I would it, never but... trade, now that I've had cancer, the way that it's made me value every moment, mm -hmm. I would never go back. But he's, yeah. he, talk about what he says. And he, he said it, and he means it. What he say? really does. What he said? He said, given what I've experienced the last 10 years and going through this process, you know, fighting the cancer. He was a surgeon, right? He was a very important heart surgeon at the Mayo Clinic. And and very accomplished and very ambitious, and I think that he gave up personally some things for ambition. First marriage didn't work out. Second marriage did, and yet he was driven by work. And then he gets this diagnosis, and he begins to let go of a number of things. And one of them is ambition. One of them is focusing on what really matters. As he said, boy, when, when death becomes real, you, you, you don't waste too much time with trivia. And he had the gift of time. He had 12 years to recraft his narrative. And he did. And he went off to Bhutan, and he and he studied Buddhism, and he studied world religions. He didn't come up with any faith narrative, but he was just enlivened by the power of love and friendship and how he lived his days now that he had cancer and was and had possessed this story and had crafted this story of what ultimately mattered, he said his days were like three-dimensional in a ways they had been black and white before. Technicolor, right? Technicolor. And he did it. And I believe him. I, I spent real time with this man. I spent the down days with him and up days with him. And that narrative was a sturdy one. And he went into, I wasn't there when he died, but he went into the night very well. And this is the one who built his own coffin and there's this coffin. with his friend yeah. and there's this moment where he talks about having to actually lie down and be fit for the coffin. Right. Yeah. That was a pretty powerful moment. It was. So. Yeah. Coming to the end. <laughs> Am I wearing you out? Yeah. <laughs> so. A re re couple of other quick things. How about just ending on part two is what I'd love. What do you mean? Part two, talking about there is a second part to this okay. Into the Night, and maybe we could talk about that. Okay, okay let's yeah. talk about part two. Yeah. Well, really quickly, what are your own personal, how are you walking away from this film? What are your own personal insights about your own mortality? Let's talk about part two. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I really okay. am. Okay. I really am. I think you can... You can tell from what I've said how important I feel it is that we take the gift of time that we all have now, and instead of waiting till the dread phone call comes, or the child dies, or we begin to be diminished in mental acuity, and and or dealing with the horrors of the healthcare system that's not going to be paying for. Our, our end of end of life uh, without a tremendous amount of grief and anxiety on our part is to really think now, not later, about what matters and to fashion. It's like your little ship of death on how you, we can live consciously now. And it, you know, from all the responses that we've gotten on this film, which have been greater in intensity and in volume and in expressions of gratitude and almost anything I've ever done in the last 40 years, that's what I'm hearing, uh, either from people who are close to death saying, I am now approaching the end with greater equanimity, or I'm hearing, thank you for provoking me. I've been postponing having this conversation with my husband of 50 years, and he doesn't want to talk about it. Now we're going to talk. Or now I am going to... Think about what matters and what truly matters, and and at three in the morning, not avoid it. Um, and I, so I feel th the film is really, you know, accomplished uh, a lot of what I hoped 
would do. And I really want it shown not only in movie theaters, which I love, of course, and I have that vanity, which all filmmakers do, and 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 in beautiful sort of theaters and museums and all of that, but I want it shown in hospices or high schools or universities or at Buddhist retreats or in or at environmental gatherings, which because the Jim Crace sequence is so much about the nature that offers a narrative, so let's not destroy it. So that's those are my hopes. And and also I really feel that part one, as strong as it is and as self-contained as it is, is even stronger if it's seen alongside of part two. Not which all which has four not hours, been released yet, right? Which has not been released and and I'm not advising seeing all four hours together, but two hours one night, two hours the next as a series. And but right now you can't get part two, right? Uh, right now, part two, for, this, for the amount of money that was required to finish part one, I also shot and edited part two. It's all done, all edited. What it's lacking, it's all done. I have Sharon Stone's voice as the narrator in. It's, it's two hours. It's ready to go. It's minus a professional mix, which is very important with the music that I have. It's minus color correction, which everybody does for all films. You enhance the colors and you sharpen. And then I have to buy the music rights and the, and the film rights, some footage that I didn't shoot myself. And I, I need a certain amount of money to do that. And And... And that's what I'm going to be spending the next years raising that money so both parts can be shown together on Hulu, part one and part two. So right now you can view it on Hulu. Uh, part one can be seen on Hulu right In, now. Into the night. Into the night, mm -hmm. Portraits of Life and Death. It's on Hulu. Okay. So part two, as soon as you can raise a little money. I mean, you'll be able to see it. You'll on, release it on Hulu as well. Yeah, and anybody out there who's interested in... In, in helping me raise funds for it, just write me. and How I do they will, contact you? Uh, they contact me through you or go on to Is my there website. Email, email address? I have or? a website, helenwhitney.com. Uh, com? Com. Okay. And into, into the night uh, doc, for into the night doc com. Or, um, you know, I live in New York on Bank Street. You can, you can find me. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so um, please support Helen Whitney. Uh, please send her whatever support you can to help her finish this film, helenwhitney.com, into the, into the night. Into the night doc. doc. That's, that's the, doc. that's the web, the, um, Helen, helenwhitney, you know, dot com is my website. Into the night doc is, you know, is the website for the film. And I'm in New York. You can find me easily and you can find me easily through you. Uh, and um, I would love to and love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And and for those and so so much of my audience are are Mormons who have lost their Orthodox faith and are either mm -hmm. trying to be progressive Mormons in the church or have left the church and are either atheist or agnostic, and or or something else. And they're trying to rebuild their life. They had this narrative, these teachings about death and the afterlife handed to them. Then those disappear. And they're struggling. One of the yeah. big core eight to ten uh, holes that develop after a Mormon faith crisis yeah. is what do I do about death? What do I do about dying? What do I do about the afterlife? I just want to say this film, Into the Night, is a piece of that puzzle. Go see it. Go to Hulu. Watch it. Marinate in it for two hours. Uh -huh. And and uh, help part two be made. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just curious if if there's anything else you would recommend a doubting, a questioning Mormon who no longer has that solace the church provided, if, if you were to give some parting words to them mm -hmm. for how they can fill that hole, other than watch your movie. Is that watch your my gift? Movie. Watch, watch the movie. Watch my movie. Watch my movie and, and get on Facebook and, and, and uh, you'll see it through the inter, Into the Night doc and engage in a conversation with me. I'll, I'll, let's continue the conversation. All right. Well, Helen Whitney, it is such a dream and a pleasure to have you honor Mormon stories to be interviewed. Well, and thank you for giving me the time. It's a rare event that you're given time without 
talking in sound bites, you know, and uh, it's respectful, it's smart, and it's a privilege. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Okay. And thanks to everyone who's joined us today on Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, please uh, support us, mormonstories.org. You can donate at the top right, uh, 10, 20, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford. Uh, your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and they go towards keeping this podcast alive. Um, we appreciate everyone who makes this possible, especially Cody Layton, who does all our production work. Big shout out to Cody. Thanks to him. And thanks to all of you who do support us. We have uh, donors who make this all possible. And I just uh, always want to just say thank you for being a donor. You make this possible. Thanks to the board members of the Open Stories Foundation for helping keep the train on the track. And again, if you value this programming, if you want to see more of it, please take the time to become a monthly donor. We lose donors regularly, and we need new donors to kind of keep things going. Uh, please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Please uh, come on and engage in the conversation at mormonstories.org. You can um, uh, you can make comments or ask questions about this documentary there. Please watch it on Hulu, and uh, please continue uh healing and growing and living big, beautiful, bold lives. So thanks to everyone again for checking us out. We'll be having some incredibly exciting interviews coming up, uh, including interviews with David Bakaboy, John Hamer, and I'm working on potentially an interview with Dan Vogel. So please stay tuned for more cool episodes and many, many more to come in the coming weeks and months. Take care, everybody. Thanks again, Helen. Okay. Good luck. Okay. <laughs>